It is time to talk technology. Matthew Dickerson, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Nick. Great to chat to you again. Great to chat to you. Coal-fired power stations, can they be somehow converted to run fossil fuel free? It sounds like a bit of a contradiction, Mm. doesn't it? And there's a great amount of irony in this particular story, Nick. Way back in 1797, John Shortland stumbled across Coal River, which became Hunter River. And the first exports from this colony, New South Wales, as it was known as the colony then, came from the Newcastle area and, of course, the first railway station. And the biggest exporting coal port in the world is Newcastle. And Newcastle University is trying to stop all that. They have come up with this brilliant little invention. And basically what it does is it captures heat. It's like a heat brick. And so basically the idea is that while you've got excess power during the day when, say, for example, you've got solar power or while you've got wind turbines spinning, you actually inject heat into these bricks. And then you've got all these coal-fired power stations around the world. They estimate 6,000 coal-fired power stations. The concept for those is pretty simple. Heat up water, turn it into steam, spin turbines. At the moment, of course, we use coal to heat up the, the actual water, but you could use these heat bricks to heat up the water. So a brilliant idea. They've got this concept going where they'll be using some uh, coal-fired power stations that have been retired in Europe to test the concept, and then if it's going to work, then commercially, I think Newcastle University will be on to an absolute winner. This is amazing. So it's almost a, a battery for thermal energy. It's a great way to describe it, actually. The, the other nice thing about it is it's about one-tenth the cost of a lithium-ion battery. But the thing that's really good about it, Nick, is that you take a battery, you've got a whole range of other pieces of infrastructure you've got to put together to basically make a battery work. Mm. But this has already got the infrastructure. We've got all these coal-fired power plants around the world. If we could just take the coal out and replace them with something else, i.e. this particular brick, for example, then you've got all the infrastructure in place already, but you can start producing clean power. So I just I love the concept. It does sound brilliant. When can we see a demo of this? Yeah, not, not tomorrow. That's, that's the unfortunate part. There's a, there's a demonstration that they'll be doing and they say that it will take place around 2023. So we're still in the early stages of it. There's a 55 mega, megawatt coal-fired power station in Europe they'll be using first of all. Probably the only disappointing part about the whole story, Nick, is that we've got this great Aussie ingenuity. We've got Newcastle University working on this great idea. When they tried to commercialise it, they couldn't find any Australian backers. So there's actually a Swiss company initially that will be backing the concept from a commercial perspective. So we might come up with this great idea, but unfortunately, if it goes ahead in leaps and bounds, there'll be some overseas companies that will be making the money out of it. Well, let's keep on that topic of Australian ingenuity. I've got a smartphone. I've got smart lights. I know people have got smart doorbells these days. What about a smart helmet? This is almost like I'm sitting in a a fighter plane because (laughs) this is basically taking every bit of technology you can think of and putting it inside a helmet. And and they've tried that, say, with the old Google Glasses, which didn't go that well. But I think the, the amount of space you had available to you in Google Glasses it was just too small. Whereas this smart helmet's got a lot more space inside it. So, for example, it can warn you about uh, traffic hazards coming up. For example, yesterday, it could there was an accident which delayed traffic. This smart helmet would have warned you about that and told you to go to the Bells line rather than going by Katoomba. It, it can actually help you with your navigation. So, if you punch something into your na- sat nav, it can actually tell you through its headphones about turns you might need to make, but also flashlights inside the helmet to tell you left turn, right turn, that type of thing. The only thing that I'm not convinced uh, the, uh, you know, the authorities might be happy about is it will also warn you about police coming up or speed cameras. Not that anyone would be speeding on their motorbike. No, of course not. If, no. if they were, then this would actually warn you about those things as well. It's even got a chin-mounted dash cam so that you can keep an eye on what's happening around the traffic. The, the other thing, and maybe this is a pointer towards how they might expect people to use the, the actual helmet, They've got a very fast clear all function so that if you do have, for example, an incident and the police might ask you to see the memory footage of your dash cam, if you were going too fast at some point in time, you've got a very easy way to clear all that footage so the police can't have that footage. So keep the footage if it's useful to you, if it's not, clear it very quickly. So a great idea. They've actually sold out $1,599 for this helmet and they've sold out the first production run already. That's not a cheap helmet, so I guess the question is, does it also protect your head in an accident in addition to flashing lights and recording your dad and doing everything else? I couldn't find any specifications about (laughs) head protection on it, Nick. (laughs) 
So the funny thing was it was developed by a University of New South Wales graduate student who had the idea initially to kind of come up with this Robocop-like device to make police safer, but unfortunately I think it's going to be used on the other side to try and keep people away from the police. I think you might be right. Let's talk hacking, and uh, not a hacking we would have expected to be chatting about. How safe is my front door key from hackers? Well, I would have said pretty safe, yeah. but unfortunately that's not the case. There's some researchers at the University of Singapore, and I'm not sure how they got funding to, to actually research this part, but they've actually researched a way to listen via a smartphone or via a hidden microphone, for example, the key noise as you insert your key into your lock, and the different noises actually illustrate to the researchers how high each pitch is on your key. They can then reverse engineer that with a 3D printer and print out a copy of your key with incredible accuracy. It might take them out of, say, 300,000 possible keys. They can produce three keys, one of which will work. So the, the reverse hacking from a physical <laughs> to something like that is, is quite incredible. Now, a lot of people talk to me, Nick. I've got lots of electronics around my home and I get in via fingerprints or via an app on my phone. And a lot of them talk to me about, am I worried about hacking? And in the past, I've said, look, yes, it is a concern, but I take steps against it. But now, a physical key, well, that might be able to hacking as well. Does that mean we need to start thinking about new technology for keys all of a sudden, that, that, that they're not as safe as we thought? <laughs> Well, I actually like the idea of two-factor authentication to your house. <laughs> I've been thinking about this. So that you, you walk up to your house, you've got your physical key, and you've got some form of electronic locking as well. So, so create that two-factor authentication. And what's going to happen then is burglars look at your house and go, oh, that Nick Healy, his house is too well protected. We're going to go next door. door. That's all we need. Uh, look, it sounds to me like the, the best safety would be a really large, really savage dog still. <laughs> I think you're right. Go, go old school, Nick. Go old school. <laughs> That's definitely hack-proof. Matthew Dickerson, thank you very much. I'm still blown away by this $1,500 smart helmet, but I'll let you go and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Nick. Matthew Dickerson is our tech expert. And yes, can you believe that? Hacking your front door key by recording the sounds it makes when it turns and then being able to turn that into a 3D print of a physical key. Unbelievable.